Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. The first day of March, we're going to be fi finishing up our series on curves and abelian varieties over finite fields. And today we're very happy to have Everett Howe, who's talking about deducing information about a curve from its Ve polynomial. So Everett, uh, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes, it is. Oh, great. Well, please go ahead. All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to speak in this series of talks. It's been very interesting so far. Um, and yes, I'm gonna be talking about um, deducing information about a curve over a finite field from its Ve polynomial. And I apologize if I'm looking off to the side because that's where my slides are. So first, I do want to start by saying that um, math is about more than working out equations on paper. It's, uh, we are human beings, we are connected to one another, and what we do and how we do it affects mathematicians and all of society. And for many of us, even our location connects us to ongoing injustices. So I am giving this talk on land that is unceded territory of the Kumeyaay people, um, the Kumeyaay have been here for more than 10,000 years, and they continue here now. And I want to recognize the violent history of colonization in California in particular, and honor the legacy of the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay nation. And for this talk, I should say that um, the talk is based on a paper I wrote last year, um, which has a very similar title. Um, it's available on the archive. Um, and hopefully, depending on what the referees say, it will end up being part of the proceedings volume for this conference they held last year, um, Curves Over Finite Fields, Past, Present, and Future, which celebrated the publication at long last of the notes to Sayre's 1985 Harvard course on Curves Over Finite Fields with many points. In particular, um, you can find more details for, I think, almost everything I'm going to say. Um, and uh, some more specific references in that paper. So here's the motivation. Um, sometimes you're doing research and you want to know something, or maybe I'd say sometimes I'm doing research and I want to know something about curves over finite fields. Um, I want to know, is there a genus G curve over some specific finite field that has some kind of nice properties that I care about? For example, does it, can I find a curve with like many points or can I find a curve with no points or can I find a curve uh, with very large gunality um, or you know, who knows? And um, if you can show that there does exist such a curve, um, I'd also like to be able to find an example of one. And a lot of times the properties that you or I am interested in um, say something about the number of points on the curve over FQ and over extensions of FQ. And that leads us to the idea of, uh, of a polynomial. So um, I should say I'm going to be assuming that you kind of know what an abelian variety over a finite field is. Um, uh, otherwise, this would have been <laughs> a much longer talk. Um, so um, suppose you have a g-dimensional abelian variety, A, over a finite field, um, and you let F be the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius endomorphism of A. And this F has a number of nice properties. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a polynomial um, with integer coefficients. It's monic, it has degree 2g. Um, all of its roots in the complex numbers have magnitude square root of q. And if it has any real roots, they occur with even multiplicity. And because of this, um, this Ve polynomial can be written in a, a more compact form, kind of. You can say f is x to the g times some other polynomial evaluated at x plus q over x for some polynomial h. This polynomial h is also a monic element of z adjoin x, its degree is g, and all of its roots are real and lie in the closed interval between minus 2 square root of q and 2 square root of q. So I call f the v polynomial of a, and we call h the real v polynomial of a because all of its roots are real. 
And if you have a curve, you, you define the Weil polynomial of the curve to be the Weil polynomial of its Jacobian. And the thing is that Weil polynomials tell you something about the number of points on the curve over every extension field. So in particular, if you let f be the Weil polynomial of some genus G curve over fq, um, then it has two G roots in the complex numbers. And we have this nice formula that gives the number of points on C over the degree n extension of fq. The main term is q to the n plus 1, and then you get this, um, essentially, the trace of uh, pi to the n. Um, and since we also have a formula for the number of points on C in terms of the number of degree d places on C, we can use Mobius inversion to get this formula. The a sub n of c, which is the number of places of degree n on c, is given by um, this formula um, in terms of the Mobius function and the number of points of various degrees on c. Um, and that leads to the basic fact that the Weil polynomial determines the number of degree n places on c for every n. and if you know the number of places on C uh, for the first G field extensions of Q, of FQ, then you know the Weil polynomial as well. So really the Weil polynomial is encoding something about the number of places on C. And a, an important theorem of Tate says that two abelian varieties over a finite field are isogenous to one another. That is, there's a non-constant surjective morphism from one to the other um, with finite kernel, um, if and only if they have the same Ve polynomial. So you learn something also about maps between abelian varieties from knowing their Ve polynomials. So the motivating questions can be rephrased a little bit. Um, given the Weil polynomial of some isogeny class of abelian varieties over FQ, can we determine whether or not there's a curve whose Jacobian lies in that isogeny class, a curve that has that Weil polynomial? And the second problem is, if we think that there is such a curve, can we deduce any properties of it that will help us find it? It's kind of a vague question, but motivating questions can be vague. So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to say something about how we might show that there aren't any Jacobians in an isogeny class. And in the second part, I'll say something about properties that we might be able to deduce that will help us find a curve, if one exists, whose Jacobian lies in a given isogeny class. All right, so part one. And I should say, if you have a question at any time, you know, feel free to, to stop and ask, and I will either put you off or else I will answer. So I didn't tell you what an abelian variety is, and I'm not actually going to tell you what a principal polarization is, but I will give you a vague description of what a principal polarization is. First of all, it's um, an isomorphism from the variety A to its dual abelian variety, A. And it has to satisfy some kind of symmetry and positivity, positivity conditions, I say very vaguely. Um, the symmetry essentially says that lambda is equal to its own dual. So if you have any map between any two abelian varieties, there is a dual map from the dual of the second one to the dual of the first. And if you do that with a polarization, the dual of the second variety is the double dual of A, which is canonically isomorphic to A, and the dual of A is A hat. So the dual of lambda is another map from A to A hat. And if lambda is a principal polarization, then it's equal to its own dual. So there is some kind of symmetry. And the positivity, um, well, essentially that's saying that lambda comes from an ample invertible sheaf. Um, in a way that I don't want to get into here. Um, mostly you just need to know that there's some symmetry and positivity floating around somewhere that might come into play. 
But for most of the time, you can just think of a principal polarization as an isomorphism from, what, from A to its dual variety. Now, these are relevant to us because a Jacobian of a curve comes provided with a canonical principal polarization. And the elementary consequence of that is if you can show an isogeny class doesn't contain any principally polarized varieties, then it certainly does not contain any Jacobians. And you may wonder whether that's an easier question or not. And in some sense, it is an easier question. Most isogeny classes of abelian varieties over a finite field contain varieties that have principal polarizations. And we can make this kind of concrete. Um, there's a lot of notation on this slide, so I'll try not to go too fast. Um, so suppose you have an isogeny class, C, and let's just look at the case where they are simple abelian varieties. They have no non-trivial sub-abelian varieties. And let F be the Vey polynomial of this isogeny class. The simplicity ends up meaning that F is going to be a power of some irreducible polynomial. Um, and that exponent also um, depends on G. Given a G, there is some exponent that will um, uh, turn it into the polynomial of simple isogeny class for G that have their roots in the right place in the complex plane. But in any case, we have this irreducible G, and we can let K be the number field defined by that polynomial. And it's a theorem that K is either a totally real number field, or it's a complex multiplication field, CM field, which is a totally imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field. If we let pi be a root of this polynomial G and K, and we let pi bar be its complex conjugate, then we have this theorem that talks about principally polarized varieties. So if K is totally real, then there's a principally polarized variety in the isogeny class. Great. If K is a CM field um, with maximal real subfield denoted by K plus, then we can say if K over K plus, if that quadratic extension is ramified at a finite prime, then there's a principally polarized variety. Or if pi minus pi bar, which is an element of K, if it's divisible by a prime of K that's inert in this quadratic extension, then again, C contains a principally polarized variety. So already, if you kind of pick an isogeny class, a simple isogeny class at random, it's going to satisfy one of those two um, properties. But third, if you're unlucky and you have one that doesn't satisfy either of those properties, then you still can sometimes determine whether or not there is a principally polarized variety. Um, so I want to assume that the isogeny class is ordinary, which simply means that the middle coefficient of f, the coefficient of x to the g, the, the, I want that coefficient to be co prime to q. So if that is true, and if the isogeny class does not satisfy the conditions in one or two, then there's an integer such that um, the norm pi minus pi bar from k to q is a square. Um, and C contains a principally polarized abelian variety if and only if its middle coefficient is congruent to the square root, the positive square root of this number, modulo m, where m is either the characteristic of the finite field or it's equal to 4 if the characteristic is 2. So I don't expect you to remember this for more than three seconds after I flip the page. Can you but say, I, Everett, a little bit about the hypotheses? So this middle coefficient being co prime to Q, that... So that, that says that it's ordinary, the ordinary. isogeny mm -hmm. class is ordinary. And because it's an ordinary isogeny class, there's a whole theory, and I, uh, uh, I 
we, we, we had a talk about that from Stefano on uh, a few weeks ago. There's a whole theory that kind of tells you that you can take the ordinary abelian varieties, the whole category, and lift it to characteristic zero, and then you could use all kinds of characteristic zero techniques. Um, so that's why you want the middle coefficient coprime to Q. And then this condition that the square root of pi minus pi bar uh, is congruent to this middle coefficient, that has to do with um, an obstruction group you can create from the class group um, of, the, of the number field defined by the polynomial. And I don't think I can get too much more specific about that. Is that at all satisfying? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so, but the gist of this is that almost always a simple abelian variety is going to be isogenous to a principally polarized one. But there is this, you know, unusual thing that can happen. And it does happen. Now, first of all, I do I do want to say um, from the first two conditions, you can show that every simple dimensional isogenous class over a finite field contains a principally polarized variety. That comes from class field theory, which says that if K is a CM field whose degree is twice an odd number, then it must be ramified over its maximal real subfield at a finite prime. And that was one of the conditions that guaranteed a principally polarized variety. But there are examples where um, you don't get the principally polarized variety. So here is one. Um, here is a degree eight polynomial. Um, you can check that it's a Vey polynomial. All of its roots have uh, 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 norm have have magnitude square root of eight. It's a Vey polynomial over the field F eight. It predicts a non-negative number of places. So if there were a curve with this uh, Vey polynomial, it would have a non-negative number of places. So there's no contradiction there. So there might be a Jacobian. Who knows? But we can check that this that the number field defined by f is unramified over its real subfield at finite primes. And we can check that the norm of pi minus pi bar is 199 squared. And we look at the middle coefficient and notice that it is 1 mod 4, but 199 is 3 mod 4. So um, C does not contain a principally polarized variety, and therefore it does not contain a Jacobian. All right, so there's one thing we can do. We can check to see whether there are any principally polarized varieties in this isogeny class. Um, but there's more we can say. Um, so suppose you have a, a billion variety with a principal polarization. We say that the principally polarized variety, A lambda, is decomposable if we can write A as a product of two non-trivial subabelian varieties. And under the isomorphism from A to that product, the polarization lambda gets identified with a product of a polarization on A1 with a polarization on A2. Um, and we say that A lambda is geometrically decomposable if when we base extend to the algebraic closure um, it, that is decomposable there. And the fact is that the canonical polarization on a Jacobian is geometrically indecomposable. And therefore, again, an easy consequence, if you have an isogeny class that has no geometrically indecomposable principally polarized varieties in it, then it also has no Jacobians. So is that something we can ever actually um, determine about an isogeny class? And in order to do that, we need to analyze how the varieties in an isogeny class split. So how can we tell whether every principally polarized variety is decomposable? Well, if you look at the real Vey polynomial of A, an abelian variety A, uh, suppose it's, it can be written as a product of two monic polynomials that are co-prime to one another. Then um, A is isogenous to a product of two abelian varieties each one with a real polynomial equal to one of the two factors. 
so you can ask, you know, you know, kind of from theory that A is isogenous to something like this. What's the degree of the smallest isogeny from A to a product? If we get a hold of that, then maybe we can say something about whether polarizations are decomposable. So there's a numerical quantity that turns out um, it's easy to compute and it can help us with this. Um, it's called the reduced resultant. So let me define it. First, if you have a monic polynomial with integer coefficients, I define the radical of the polynomial to be the product of the irreducible factors each taken once. And if we have two coprime monic polynomials, H1, H2, we let capital H1 and capital H2 be their radicals. And we let I be the ideal of Z adjoin X generated by those two radicals. And we define the reduced resultant of H1 and H2 to be the positive generator of the ideal of Z that you get by intersecting this ideal of Z adjoin X with Z. And another way of saying this is that the reduced resultant of H1 and H2 is the smallest positive integer you can get as a Z to the X, uh, Z X linear combination ah, oops, of these two radicals. So here is kind of a basic result. Suppose you have an abelian variety with real of a polynomial H that you can write as a product with H1 and H2, the two factors co-prime. Then there are unique abelian varieties A1 and A2 with the real of a polynomials H1 and H2, and a unique finite group scheme such that there is an exact sequence of this shape you get an isogeny from A1 times A2 to A, and kernel is delta. And this, the thing about this exact sequence the, the, that you're looking for is that um, the induced maps from A1 to A and from A2 to A are injective. Then this A1 and A2 and delta are unique. And in addition, when you have this sequence, the other things you know about it are that the induced maps from delta into A1 and from delta into A2 are both embeddings. And this is the key point. This delta is annihilated by the reduced resultant of H1 and H2. So the reduced resultant um, gives you a bound on the size of the isogeny from A1 times A2 to A. And I'll just kind of sketch the idea of the proof because this is really kind of a basic result. Remember the goal is at the top of the page. Um, uh, we want to show there exists a unique A1, A2, and delta that give us this exact sequence where the maps from the AI into A are injective. And we want to show that delta is killed by the reduced resultant. So basically what you do is you start with any two varieties, B1 and B2, um, with the right real vape polynomials. And we know uh, from Tate's theorem that there's an isogeny from B1 times B2 to A. So you look at the kernel of that isogeny and you find the largest product of the form delta 1 times delta 2 in its kernel where delta 1 is a subscheme of B1 and delta 2 is a subscheme of B2. And then you divide B1 times B2 by delta 1 times delta 2, um, and you get a new exact sequence. Except now, because you've divided out by the parts of the kernel that all lie in one factor, because of that, now you know that um, A1 is a sub variety of A and A2 is a sub variety of A. And it also shows that delta injects into both A1 and A2. So that kind of tells you that there is going to be a diagram like this. And then we could say, you know, let's look at the Frobenius and the Verschiebung. The Verschiebung is the dual isogeny of the Frobenius endomorphism. 
um, the thing about the real Weil polynomial is that um, it is satisfied by f plus v, the endomorphism f plus v. And moreover, not just h, um, it's actually true of the radical um, of h. So h of f plus v is zero as an endomorphism. And because the Frobenius and Verschiebung of A restrict to the Frobenius and Verschiebung of the factors, we also see that Hi of V plus F is zero on Ai. But delta injects into Ai for both i's. So um, we also know that Hi of F plus V is zero on delta. And since the reduced resultant is a z adjoin x linear combination of the two h's, that means that r is also equal to zero on delta, which is another way of saying that delta is killed by r. So that's where the reduced resultant comes in. Um, it's the fact that it's a z zx linear combination of these two um, radicals is the key property. All right, so there's a wonderful application of this um, uh, that Serre proved in 1985 in, in his course. Um, if the reduced resultant is equal to one and delta is killed by the reduced resultant, then delta is trivial, which means that A is actually isomorphic to a product. And because A1 and A2 were assumed to have co-prime real Weil polynomials, there are no maps other than the zero map between them. So every polarization on A1 times A2 is a product. Um, and a final fact is that you can show that the reduced resultant of two polynomials is one if and only if the usual resultant is equal to plus or minus one. So we get Sarah's result. If the real V polynomial of an isogeny class can be written as a product where the resultant of the two factors is plus or minus one, then the isogeny class contains no Jacobians because every polarization is decomposable. Okay. So let's look at, app, at an application of this. Um, suppose you happen to be wondering whether there is a genus eight curve over F4 with 24 points, because for a while, this was the best upper bound we had for the number of points on a genus eight curve over F4. Then one of the possible real Weil polynomials such a curve could have is this one here. Um, there actually are 26 isogeny classes that might possibly occur, and this is one of them. But for this one, um, we can write H as a product with H1 being this term and H2 being that term. And you compute that, um, oh, I think I meant the reduced resultant. We can compute that the reduced, oh, no, actually the, the regular resultant, I'm sorry. The regular resultant of those two things is just one. So there's no Jacobian, which means that there is no curve with that real V polynomial. So we only have 25 isogeny classes left to consider. All right, so now let me turn to another way that you might show there are no Jacobians in an isogeny class. I'm going to look at very special isogeny classes. Suppose you have an elliptic curve over Q with trace T, and uh, that should be a where, not a were, where delta, um, the T squared minus 4Q, is a fundamental discriminant of a quadratic order then principal polarizations on e to the n, on this particular variety, correspond to n by n positive definite unimodular Hermitian matrices over O. That's again, symmetry and positivity. The symmetry is the Hermitian property and the positivity is this positive definite property. And a nice fact is that if O has class number one, then the only variety isogenous to e to the n is e to the n. There's only one variety in the isogeny class. So here's a result on indecomposable Hermitian forms. 
assume that we're in the case where delta is non-zero. Then there's a principally polarized abelian variety, isogenist E squared, if and only if delta is not one of those three discriminants. There's the principally polarized abelian variety, isogenous to E cubed, if and only if delta is not one of those four discriminants. And Serre proved this in his 1985 course. It follows from results of Hoffman from 1991, who um, uh, analyzed um, Hermitian forms on O modules. Um, and some other work which shows that when delta is not in these cases, then um, there is um, uh, a uh, principally polarized abelian variety. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a principally polarized abelian variety um, with a non-degenerate polarization. I'm sorry. I, I forgot to put non-degenerate there. A non, you know, an indecomposable. So for small exponents, sometimes you can show there are no um, uh, indecomposable principal polarizations um, if you're in these very special cases, which do show up. But you can't hope that this is going to do um, much for you for higher dimensions, because um, if you take an elliptic curve with any non-zero delta, and if n is 8 or 12 or anything bigger than 13, then there's a variety isogenous to e to the n that has an indecomposable principal polarization. This follows from result, a result of Omera, who showed that uh, there are indecomposable unimodular z lattices of rank n. And then Smith showed that if you take one of those and tensor it with O, you get an indecomposable Hermitian form. All right, so there's another technique that can work in kind of very specialized cases. So we're already getting to more specialized stuff. Um, here's another thing that you might be able to do. Um, there are counting arguments that can show there are no um, indecomposable principal polarizations. And in order to have a counting argument, you have to be able to count something. So here is a result on the number of uh, principally polarized abelian varieties and with certain properties. Again, let's work with a um, isogeny class of simple, ordinary abelian varieties. Let k be the number field defined by the Vey polynomial, and let pi be a root of this Vey polynomial. We say that an order in k is convenient if it contains pi and is stable under complex conjugation. And if its maximal real suborder is Gorenstein, and if the trace dual of O um, is generated as an O module by its totally imaginary elements. These are maybe slightly unusual, unusual conditions, but it turns out that they are exactly what you need in order to give a formula for the number of principally polarized varieties in C that have endomorphism ring O. So here's the result. If you have a convenient order, and if the norm map from the Picard group of O to the narrow Picard group of O+, plus, if that norm map is surjective, which it often is, um, the number of principally polarized varieties with endomorphism ring O is equal to, uh, well, I can't highlight that, is equal to this um, quantity. So you take the size of the Picard group, divide it by the size of the Picard group of O plus, and divide all of that by the index of the squares of the units of O plus in the norms of the units of O. This index is either one or two. So essentially, the number of principally polarized varieties is this ratio of class numbers. For maximal orders, this is essentially due to Shimura and Taniyama from their book from 1961. And in this generality, um, it's something that I finally wrote up um, a couple of years ago. So here's an application of that. 
let q be an odd prime power, then there are no geometrically irreducible principal polarized varieties with this they polynomial. So to show this, these are these are the steps. We first show that every principally polarized abelian variety in this isogeny class has an endomorphism ring that's convenient. So we can apply this class number formula. Then we count the number of principally polarized abelian varieties by using this class number formula. But then we can also count the number of elliptic curves over the quadratic extension that have this as their Weyl polynomial. Notice that that's the same as the one we started with, only the powers of x are halved. And for each such elliptic curve, if we take its Weyl restriction down to fq, that will turn in a one-dimensional variety over fq squared into a two-dimensional variety over fq. Um, and in fact, it'll give us a variety with the Weyl polynomial we're concerned with. And it gives us a variety with a, a, a geometrically decomposable polarization. So we can count how many E's there are. And we already knew how many principally polarized varieties we had. And you can show that those two numbers, by some miracle, are equal to one another. So every principally polarized variety comes from a Weyl restriction of an elliptic curve, and therefore its polarization is decomposable. So this is, it, the fact that this argument works is some kind of miracle, um, but it works. Okay. So I think this might be the last of our ways of showing there's no abelian variety. Um, it's sometimes called the super singular factor method. So suppose you have a finite field whose order is a square and let S be one of the two square roots of Q. And suppose you have an isogeny class whose real poly Weyl polynomial factors as uh, H zero times some power of, of x minus 2s. And we want to assume that h0 is an ordinary real Weyl polynomial. And the theorem is that if, if you take h0 and evaluate it at 2s, and if that integer is square free, then every principally polarized variety in C is decomposable. And the idea for this proof um, is, again, you start with this kind of fundamental exact sequence that tells you how to split your given abelian variety. And you know that this kernel delta embeds in both factors. It embeds in a0 and it embeds in e to the n. And the thing is that Frobenius and Verschiebung both act as the integer s on this factor. That's one of the things that happens when you have a super singular uh, elliptic curve. So Frobenius and Verschiebung act as an integer um, on delta, but they don't act as integers on a naught. And the thing is that you can see that this is true just by looking at the image of delta inside of a naught. And this depends on some additional properties of delta, and it depends on this condition that h naught of 2s is square free in ways that I don't want to get into for reasons of time. But that's kind of the general philosophy here is that this kernel embeds both into something where Frobenius and Verschiebung act as integers and into something where they very much do not act as rational integers. Um, and you can play those two things off one another to show that delta has to be trivial. So here's another example. We have 25 isogeny classes over uh, F4 left to deal with. And here's one of them. Um, uh, here's a, here's a, a real Weyl polynomial for a genus eight curve. We notice that it factors in this way, H naught times X plus four. 
um, and nicely four is um, I hope I said two s did I say two s yes um, four is twice the square root of four um, and we compute that if we take our h naught and evaluate it at negative four we get 15 which is a square free number so there's no Jacobian in this isogeny class So now there's only 24 isogeny classes left. So this kind of summarizes um, the ways that we have for showing that there's no Jacobian in an isogeny class. First, we have this method where we can show sometimes that there are no principally polarized varieties. Then we have the resultant one method, which shows that every principally polarized variety has a decomposable polarization. Then there are these special Hermitian modules, which show up rarely, but they do occur. Then there's this counting argument, which I only know one example of, um, but it worked in that example. And then we have um, the super sleeve factors argument. And I th think those are all the methods I know for showing there's no Jacobian in an isogeny class, aside from enumeration or something like that. So we can move on now to deducing information about curves, but this seems like a good place to ask if there are questions. This is Rachel. I have a quick question. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering in, for each of your theorems, you had an example. And I wondered whether you found the example first and then proved the theorem based on it, or whether you proved the theorem first and then found, searched for the examples. I do have to say that um, one of the projects that I've been involved with is trying to um, uh, improve the upper bounds on the number of points on curves of a given genus over a given finite field. Uh, it's something that Kristen Lauder um, brought to my attention many, many years ago. We worked on it together. and you end up with all these isogeny classes you have to look at and you're banging your head against the wall. Um, and um, yeah, so some of these things like the super singular factor method definitely came from trying to deal with an example. Um, the resultant, well, some other stuff that I'm about to show you also came from similar things. So lots of inspiration from tr trying to improve these upper bounds. Okay. Uh, so hey, suppose, hi, yes. Can Josh. I ask another? Um, yeah. This may be an unanswerable question, but uh, do you have any sense of whether these methods cover most of the uh, cases uh, possible? Or, or I mean, you 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 you, you uh, uh, vaguely quantified some of these things as rare and some of them as common. Can you? Can you classify what's left uh, as rare or common? Yeah, unfortunately, the thing which was rare was uh, not having a principally polarized variety in the isogeny class. I think, you know, a typical isogeny class at random is going to be ordinary and it's going to be simple um, and it's going to have a principally polarized variety in it. And, uh, <laughs> there's not much you can do in in those cases so it's it's actually kind of lucky that when we're looking at these extremal things like curves with many points we end up getting these unusual isogeny classes where these techniques are likely to work yeah thanks yeah all right so um here are some of the things you can do um when you're trying to find properties of curves just based on their vape polynomials. Um, and a basic result is Torelli's theorem, which says that if you have a curve with polarized Jacobian uh, J lambda, uh, then you get a homomorphism from the automorphism group of C to the automorphism group of the polarized Jacobian. Um, and you do that by taking that automorphism of C, taking its inverse, and then taking its pullback on the Jacobian. And you have to take the inverse because that's how you get um, it to be a homomorphism, since pullback is uh, an anti. Um, uh, it's a it's a oh, what do you call a functor? A contravariant functor. Um, 
so if C is hyperelliptic, then this homomorphism is an automorphic, uh, uh, isomorphism, sorry, is an isomorphism. Otherwise, um, the automorphism group of the polarized Jacobian is twice as big as the automorphism, automorphism group of C. C. The automorphism group of C embeds into the automorphism group of the Jacobian, and if you throw in plus or minus one, then you get everything. So what are some ways of getting non-trivial automorphisms? Uh, here's one thing that we can do when our H is the product of two um, co-prime factors, H1 and H2. As we've seen before in this situation, for any A, um, we can get an exact sequence like this. And here's the thing you can observe. Suppose A2 has an automorphism alpha. And suppose that it satisfies this technical condition that A times A dagger is equal to one for every positive involution on the endomorphism ring of A2. If, if the endomorphism ring of A2 is an order in a CM field, there is only one positive involution, it's complex conjugation. And this simply means that alpha would be a root of unity. And suppose that alpha minus one kills the image of delta in A2. If those things happen, then the automorphism that acts as one on A1 and alpha on A2 descends to give an automorphism of um, the quotient A because um, one acts as the identity on delta and alpha acts as the identity on delta. So you get something descending down to A and this condition on the positive involutions ensures that it respects the polarization lambda. So if you have an A2 that has an automorphism, you have a chance of getting an automorphism of this quotient. And one thing to note is that every abelian variety has a non-trivial non -trivial automorphism, namely multiplication by negative one. So alpha equals negative one is something that applies here. And we get what's called the resultant two method. So if C is a curve with real vape polynomial H1 times H2, and if the reduced resultant of H1 and H2 is two, then this curve has an involution that defines a double cover C to D, where D has a real vape polynomial either H1 or H2. And I should say that this uncertainty between H1 and H2 is exactly the same uncertainty there is in Torelli's theorem with this plus or minus one. That's where it comes from. And the idea is exactly um, what I just said. Since the reduced result is two, delta is killed by two. And this condition here is that negative one minus one kills delta. So, you know, if, if, if delta is killed by two, we can apply this argument and we get an involution that defines a double cover. So for instance, how does this help us? Suppose um, we have an isogeny class with a real vape polynomial H1, H2, where H1 is that and H2 is this. Um, it could be something uh, coming from a genus eight curve over F4 with 24 points. Um, but the reduced resultant of these factors is two. So if there were such a curve, it would be a double cover of a curve D whose real vape polynomial is either H1 or H2. It can't be H2 because H2 has degree five. So D would then have genus five and you can't have a genus eight curve covering a genus five curve by the Riemann Hurwitz formula. So it can't be H2. But it can't be H1 either, because if D had real vape polynomial H1, then um, we would compute how many points it has over the base field. It would have six plus four plus one is 11, but it's supposed to be covered by a curve with 24 points. And if you start with 11 points and take a double cover, you can't get 24 points, because at most you get two points lying over every rational point down below. So, neither possibility works, so there's no such C.
You can also get non-trivial automorphisms when you have a Bay polynomial that's the power of a simple one. If the subring z pi pi bar of the number field defined by um, h0, by, by, uh, blah, blah, of f0, the Bay polynomial, um, uh, if it contains a root of unity, then C will have an automorphism uh, given by that root of unity. Um, I don't want to say too much more about this. Um, but I do want to give an application. Uh, there is no curve over FQ with the Vape polynomial of this shape. And the proof for odd Q is that this Vape polynomial is irreducible. We compute what pi and pi by r, and we notice that their difference is the primitive fourth root of unity. So any curve with this Vape polynomial, its Jacobian has a fourth root of one acting on it. Um, so if C has a Vape polynomial f, it would have an automorphism of order four. You check the action of this automorphism on the Weierstrass points, and you show that, and you can show that all six Weierstrass points are defined are rational over f q to the fourth. The non-Weierstrass points come in epsilon orbits of size four, which means that if you count the number of points on c over f q to the fourth, you get some multiple of four plus the Weierstrass points, of which there are six. So the number of points in total is two and four. But the Vey polynomial tells you how many points there should be, and it tells you there should be this many points over fq to the fourth. But that's, um, uh, I'm sorry, that should be zero mod four. <laughs> yes, it is zero mod four, exactly. Um, and uh, you can't have something that's both zero mod four and two mod four. So there's no curve with this Vey polynomial for any finite field. One other way, if you have um, a Vey polynomial, a real Vey polynomial that's um, of the form power of x minus e, um, where this delta is the discriminant of a maximal order, um, then Shimon has computed all unimodular Hermitian forms on rank n lattices over maximal orders O for various small values of n and small orders O. You can find uh, these um, forms listed on this website. And he gives the automorphism groups of all these lattices. So, for example, Here's a different type of example. Let's look at genus five curves over F17, meeting the Ve Serre bound on the number of points. The example is that there is no genus five curve over F17 that attains the Ve Serre, Serre bound of three points. And the idea is that um, a curve meeting the bound would have this real Ve polynomial, and delta is 19, negative 19. You check Schiemann and you find out that all rank five unimodular Hermitian O lattices have automorphisms over order four. So every genus five curve over for F17 with that many points has an automorphism of order four and therefore also an involution. The involution can only give you a double cover of a curve with this real Ve polynomial. It can't be a higher power um, uh, and it can't be a lower power. It can't be a lower power by point counts. It can't be a higher power by a different argument. There's only one such genus two curve. It's that one. You could enumerate its genus five double, genus five double covers and you observe that none of them has 53 points. Uh, and I'm running low on time. So I'll just say that um, if you have a curve whose real Vey polynomial is divisible by x minus t, where t is the trace of an elliptic curve, then you um, know there is a map from c to e of some degree. And in certain circumstances, you can bound the degree of that map. So um, here's a result that says the reduced resultant of two factors of Vey polynomial can gives you a, a 
a bound on the degree of a map from C to an elliptic curve of trace T. And I will just end with an example I don't know quite how to cover. So if you're looking at genus 12 curve over F2 with 15 points, that's the best known upper bound. There's only three possible real V polynomials that aren't eliminated by other methods. One of them is this. Um, and we see that there's this factor, x plus 1 squared. So this corresponds to an ordinary elliptic curve, the x plus 1 does. So there is going to be a map from C to the unique elliptic curve of trace negative 1. And the arguments that I haven't gone into show that the degree is at most 4. But by looking at the numbers of points, you see that the degree has to equal 4. And it would be nice to be able to finish up by like enumerating the double the degree four powers of e by curves of genus 12. It would be nice to be able to enumerate them and then see whether any of them have 15 points, but I don't know how to enumerate them. It seems like it should be possible, but I haven't worked it out. Um, but that's an open question. Um, we still don't know what the bound is for the number of points on a genus 12 curve over F2. Um, there's an example with 14 points, and we don't know if there is one with 15 points. Um, it's the lowest genus over F2 for which we don't know the bound. So that is something that might be worth looking at. So there's only a few techniques for getting property of curves that I know of. There's the resultant two method, which has been very productive. It tells you something about double covers, and then you can either enumerate them or show they can't exist. There are these other methods of deducing the existence of automorphisms, which can also help. And sometimes you could find maps of bounded degree to an elliptic curve. But that's all I know how to do. Um, so it would be nice to have any other techniques to help us learn something about useful properties of a curve, um, just given its way polynomial. And I'm not sure where such a result would come from. So there's still plenty of things. And that is the talk. Thank you, Everett. That was wonderful. So any questions? Well, maybe I could start with a question. Um, in your open problem on the last, um, on the previous slide, can you say anything about um, what happens under certain conditions on the Gawa group? Like if the degree four cover is Gawa or if the um, composition down to uh, P1 is Gawa? Yeah, certainly if, if, we, if we knew something, like if it was a Galois degree four cover, then it should be easy to do because you can do it in two steps by Art and Trier extensions and it, should not be a problem mm -hmm. but you know if it's an s4 cover uh, i mean i think you can like characterize them but i haven't looked at the details of that to see exactly how it will work mm -hmm. um I, I have looked at degree three covers with gaba group s3 and managed to get something with those but i haven't tried a degree four cover yet Great, let's see, any other questions here? I know there was a lot of stuff in that talk trying to give this overview, so mm -hmm. I understand if people are feeling a little overwhelmed. Well, there are many references also to process, so. I was wondering if you wanted to, I, I posted a link to many points. I was wondering if you wanted to say anything. Yes about that website or, or you yeah. know, how often does it get updated? Like, are you getting in new results every week or once a year? Or... Uh, it's it's slowed down. Um, for a while, there were some people um, who were having fun finding examples of curves with many points to improve the lower bounds. Um, uh, but it's been a while since we've had many improvements on upper bounds. Um, 
I, th I think some in the past couple of months, I may have added a few for small genera, but that's that's it. So it's it's been a while. There is a on the web page. There is a recent updates tab, um, you, and you can see like the last, um, I don't know, six or eight new things. So I take it for you know if, if I'm if I'm looking to to give you a, a useful update, I should really be focusing on on tightening the upper bounds at least for the for the small queues. The lower bounds uh, are probably tighter. Is that not what you want? for small queue? Maybe, but once the genus gets larger, it gets you know you know people are looking in the places where there is light, so to speak, um, and yeah. so who knows what's happening with kind of generic curves and things like that so so if, if you have some idea for a, a class of curves that might have a lot of points it's certainly worth running through them to see if you get something better than the current lower bound so i sort of feel like we should have a betting market here like for for genus say just for example take genus six and q is five i look on your page and i see there's an unknown range there but an interval between 22 could be 22, 23, or 24, that's the correct upper bound. And so if you were going to place your bets, put down your markers, which number would you pick? Hmm. I might have to look to see how far those are away from the Vaisere bound or the Ostole bound or something to see how many isogeny classes there are. Um, yeah, I don't know. OK, well, this this is useful feedback already. I had assumed it was sort of the, all the low bounds, lower bounds had been sort of sorted out. But the fact that you're not sounding super confident makes me think that maybe not. Well, one, one thing to think about is that um, sometime in the past 10 years, I wrote a paper looking at genus four curves. Um, and I was able to improve like almost every single lower bound um, mm -hmm. that was there. Um, and then a while later, I looked at genus five, six, and seven, and I was also able to improve a lot of lower bounds. So some things people just haven't looked at, okay. especially if it's not over uh, uh, a, a famous finite field like F2 or F3. If it's over, you know, F17 squared, then that doesn't get a lot of love. So. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Well, that's some motivation for, for us all to go looking a little harder. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Everett. If anyone has questions they are thinking about later on, feel free to email me um, uh, either however at alumni caltech edu or everett.how at gmail. Either of those will work.